This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. In each episode, we bring you information, insights, ideas, and interviews from some of the industry's top thought leaders. Head to mediasalesmastery.com to help pick the topic and guide the show. This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. I'm your host, Jamie Wood, and our guest today is Richard Wentworth-Ping, founder and managing director of Wentworth People. Now, these guys are an international consulting, training, coaching business focused on helping companies build high-performance cultures. The topic we're covering today is overcoming internal politics, which is a deliberately provocative episode title and something we need to call out as a key career skill that people don't spend enough time developing. Part of being a successful media salesperson is having a high level of emotional intelligence and understanding how to identify and overcome the inevitable political issues and dynamics that are present and that arise within our own organizations, within our industry, and within the customer base that we are selling into. Whether it's dealing with a difficult co-worker, trying to balance the objectives of a demanding client and an unrelenting editorial team, or just working through complex organizational issues in a way that protects your professional profile, a good understanding of workplace politics is key. So let's jump into it now. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jamie. Good to be here. To frame our conversation, in your definition, what are internal organizational politics and why is it so vital to develop skills to overcome them? Okay, so the the definition of politics uh, and calling people political has a, a very negative connotation. I mean, if you think of classic TV shows recently, uh, Game of Thrones uh, is all about the politics. I mean, it's got other stuff as well. Uh, House of Cards, uh, the one I'm currently watching, Succession. Great show. I'm, I'm just through uh, season two as well. Great show. Do not tell me what happens. I'm only on episode five. So, uh, but, <laughs> so it's got really negative connotations. Pol- politicians have just come out of a survey in Australia as the least trusted people. Um, so if you call someone political... That's generally not a good thing. Um, I I do a reframe in the context of this podcast that what we're really talking about being political and understanding the politics of your organisation is understanding how the system works. Now, that covers both the company you're working in uh, and the politics of your organisation and how things get done and also the politics of the organisation that you're selling in into either as a client or a prospect. Clearly, if they're an existing client, you've probably got more insight into how their system works. If it's a prospect in your pipeline, um, you've got to work harder to understand how that system works. So that's really what we're talking about. Uh, Every organisation is a system. It's got structures, got policies, got ways of doing things uh, that are sometimes quite different if you go from one organization to another, sometimes they're quite nuanced and subtle. Um, uh, the culture, you know, in my experience, or, um, how things get done aligns to the system. And, and frankly, if you do not understand the system uh, that you're working with and uh, into, you're going to have a world of pain. And you're going to have ongoing problems. And, the, you know, if you're a media sales professional, you are going to be super frustrated going, why is this particular um, sale that I thought was, you know, over the line, it's stalling, it's got loss, it's like, and you know, you kind of blame everybody else. Well, it's like, uh, um, you know, you've got, to, <laughs> you've got to work the politics. Uh, it's not about being compliant politically. It's actually about being really smart. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really, really good summary when we think about what we do as media salespeople fundamentally we are somewhat in between two different sets of political dynamics be that the the organization we're selling into and the organization we're operating within and often we are an internal advocate for our clients within our own business and you know there's multiple stakeholders involved in putting a client solution together in negotiating a contract there are a lot of different objectives in organizations and and corporate life is getting increasingly complex i think that's just a common theme from everybody i speak to so i think it's a really good topic for us to get in today but let's jump into the first 5 now the first 5 before we kick into the main topic i want to know a little bit more about wentworth people richard can you give me a bit of an overview of who you guys are and what you do so let's go back and relate 
my backstory to uh, your listeners that I started off uh, having got a business studies degree in the UK. I uh, went client side first uh, to a big M- FMCG company, uh, United Biscuits, and I went through marketing, sales, key account management. Um, I then moved into media sales at a London-based um, magazine, B2B magazine uh, company, uh, and both companies did a lot in terms of uh, learning and development. We call it training in those days. I then moved to another media company, uh, EMAP, also based in London, the heady days of the mid 80s. Um, and you know, really learned my craft both as a media salesperson across different uh, media platforms, uh, but also as a uh, sales manager uh, and a publisher. Then Uh, I came out to Australia, uh, got involved in training. I always liked training. And really for the last 30 years, what I've been doing is um, learning and development for, and certainly in the last 21 years in Australia, predominantly for media companies, uh, agencies, both creative and media and digital, um, really building capability in people, uh, organizational culture, leadership, management. Uh, My strap line is uh, enjoy your working life, which really, uh, if I go back to the early days of selling, if if you're in sales and you don't have the skills and the tools, uh, selling can be pretty miserable. You're not hitting your targets, you're getting grief from your manager. So my thinking is the more I can build people's skills, their knowledge, their confidence, they're going to go out into the market. Uh, uh, look, we're not going to win every sale, but you're going to enjoy the whole process. I think uh, selling is actually a wonderful profession to be in. I uh, still get a buzz from um, uh, winning a sale, from moving it through the pipeline to influencing people. Um, so that's what I do. I'm based in Australia, in Sydney. I've got an office in Singapore. I have a team of people that I use uh, predominantly freelancers now uh, to do work uh, under my brand. I still am on the tools myself and um, I work with a variety of organisations now and still enjoying it 30 years on. And and that range of industries you work across, somewhat within sort of the media marketing advertising landscape, I'm curious to know what's your favourite thing about the media industry? What What keeps you you know, enthused to uh, to keep running your organisation and focusing on that segment of the market? If we just look at the media industry, uh, I am an avid consumer of media, um, you know, quite deliberately and by choice. Um, I, I think media is such an important part of society, uh, whether it is um, free-to-air, whether it is government-sponsored. I, I was born in the UK so the, the model of media is, is similar. Some of the players are similar. Um, you know, Murdoch runs the, the, the newspapers. There's the BBC versus the ABC. Uh, the world needs um, media. So that's one reason. I, I've also always liked the people in uh, media. Now you could say that of any industry. I, I do not know anybody in the petrochemical industry. I'm sure there are wonderful people there. But uh, the thing I've always liked about media is it's, it's got a vibrancy and a youth. Uh, and this isn't me just clinging to my youth. I, I just find it is a vibrant industry. There's a lot of creative people, a lot of good energy. You know, that's what keeps me coming back. It's also something that I know intimately from my own career. Um, and I think, I think there is a, an excellence that you can generate in yourself with a deep, knowledge of a particular sector. Um, uh, I'm a big believer in getting outside your comfort zone. I'm working at the moment with as diverse companies as an egg producer, a a biotechnology company, uh, an accountancy practice, a book publishing company. Uh, So it's pretty varied. So I am stretching myself, but I I do think as we go through life, we, we... have a love for certain industries and media is is mine. Expanding on that point you make around maybe people being one of the key differentiators for the media industry, 
I, I really, I ask every guest this question. I want to know from you, what skills does somebody need to have in order to master media sales as a profession? It's interesting that you've used the word skills. Uh, I, I'm going to expand it into three sections because I think if you're really looking to be excellent in this profession and you're in your first you know, few years, you need to look at your personal attributes, you need to look at your skills, and you need to look at your knowledge. So if, if we take skills first, there's quite a long list. Um, your listeners will be familiar with some of these, but clearly you've got to be a good listener. Um, the, the saying, you've got to have two ears, one mouth, use them in that proportion, is, is as true now as it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, uh, the idea that you, you never learn anything new when you're doing the talking uh, is, is a truism. So you need to be a good listener. You need to be extremely good at asking questions, uh, not just off a list that you've prepared, but to be able to ask questions on the back of what someone else has asked you. Uh, and the discipline and the skill to do that is, is something that you learn. I think you've got to be highly articulate. You've got to be able to argue your case in a clear, concise way. Um, you've got to be able to present well. You've got to have uh, self-awareness is a skill that you can learn. Uh, you've got to be able to adjust and pivot. Uh, quite often, I have worked with salespeople who go in and they go, I'm going to sell this. And it's almost a predetermined option. I, I think that is um, highly risky um, and takes you down a path where you probably don't ask enough questions, you don't listen. But this ability to go, based on what I've heard the client say or the person say, I need to pivot where I go and I need to be able to do it quickly and in the moment. Um, you've got to be able to write well, not just in proposals, but to emails. You've got to be able to put in the written word without using overly familiar vernacular or, or whatever uh, in a way that lands clearly for whoever's reading it. You've got to be able to negotiate well. Uh, you've got to close well. You've got to be able to think strategically. A lot of people operate and think just tactically. Presentation, we've talked about emotional control. Uh, you've got to be able to build rapport with lots of different people. You know, I'm, I'm going on. I think you need to be a good administrator. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I'll hire extroverts to be my salespeople. I think that's a mistake. I think the best salespeople are ambiverts. They sit somewhere in the middle of extroversion and introversion. Um, You've got to be good at time management uh, and prioritization, managing your territory. So those are all skills. Knowledge, you need to have a deep knowledge of both the sales cycle and the buying cycle. In other words, those two uh, cycles that the, the two parties engaged in the sales process are going to go through you need to have a deep knowledge of buyer psychology and the whole psychology of selling and what influences people personality type you need to have deep knowledge of people often go oh yeah i've done a personality uh, profile i've either you know i've done my disc or i've done myers briggs or something like that and i go oh, okay great do you remember what you were ah uh, no not really well sometimes they can reel off oh i'm an enfp or i'm an intj or whatever and i go okay so what does that mean uh, i think i'm an introvert and the end it's like so you don't really know this you, you've basically got a superficial knowledge uh, and you've been on a course one year ago or two years ago and you're done. It's like there's no curiosity to go deeper. You need deep knowledge, uh, sales theory and how that's evolved, you know, emotional intelligence theory and the competencies. And then finally, I think attributes. And again, you could have a long list here, but the ones that I really think are important are a natural curiosity. Uh, a discipline, uh, and I, the, the, the discipline of how you operate each day um, to do the right things, repeatable, iterative, you know, you build habits in, you know, I'm watching the Rugby World Cup, Eddie Jones, after they beat the All Blacks, he said, you know, we've been building habits for four years, <laughs> you know, they're ingrained. 
Um, resilience, you know, don't get into sales if you're fragile. <laughs> um, you've got to have a hunger. Uh, you've got to have a humility and you've got to have an innate confidence, which, by the way, is built on good skills and uh, good knowledge. It's important that you you went through that in detail because it really proves a point uh, that I think was one of the reasons why I wanted to create this podcast, which is there is a depth and breadth to the skills required to to operate in this industry long term. And I think we often make the mistake that you said earlier around thinking that, oh, they work in sales. They're they're an extroverted person. They love people. And and that's what it is. It's this one dimensional kind of industry or this one dimensional role. It's a it, it's it's a combination of technical skills, interpersonal skills, knowledge, personal attributes, you know, emotional intelligence. It's a rich tapestry of different things that actually form a good media salesperson. And part of this podcast is is really designed to shine a light on that um, and, and to, to make people aware of the fact that within the profession of media sales, all of these things, you know, need to have focus and attention on them and need to be developed over time. So let's jump into the main topic now of organisational politics. Media Sales Mastery. When we're talking in the context of organisational politics and managing those, can you talk a little bit about some of the different factions, stakeholders, business units that typically exist within your your stereotypical media organisation and what are some of the ensuing organisational politics that will typically arise from these media structures? If I go back to you know my origin story and I, I'm in print, I was in print media, magazines both um, monthly and weekly, I never, I never worked on a daily and you know when we were sort of planning this podcast um, you said there's a common split between the sales function who are out there trying to win business and what you broadly described as content, okay? In a print setting, newspapers, magazines, that's your editorial department, radio, that is the the on-air talent, um, TV, again, on-air talent. So you have a natural tension there, um, which creates a lot of politics. So you talk about factions. Um, the editorial integrity faction, you know, is, you know, we're not going to sell out, <laughs> versus the sales faction, who pays your bills, pal? The advertisers, <laughs> you know, get real. There's that faction. Then you've got others. You've got the faction of the commercial finance function, you've got the marketeers. Let's assume that the organisation you're working in is is functional rather than dysfunctional. There's an element of dysfunctionality in every organisation, but let's say they're functional, that we've got a media company with a clear goal and vision about what they want to be and where they want to get to. Uh, They've got some values. People are bought into those values. So kind of hope that Everybody is broadly speaking heading in the same direction. Even within that context, and that might be a stretch, there's plenty of dysfunctional media organisations I've uh, I've worked uh, with. People basically are KPI'd and goal and goals on their own particular patch of the organisation, and therefore their first priority because that is often what their performance managed on is to hit their goals and kpis not the salesperson's goals and kpis so you have a natural adversarial position there push and pull and if you do not understand that both in your own organization and the client or the prospect's organization because this is all happening in the client you know you may have seen someone in the client and they go, I really like this. And you mentioned about advocacy before that we often as salespeople, we see one or two people, they're all revved up. Oh, this is great, Jamie. Send us a proposal. So you send Richard a proposal. Richard's got to sell it up the line. (laughs) If he can't advocate well, uh, you're done. You know, if you haven't really understood the politics of the organization and ask specific questions about that, then surprise, surprise, it may not get up. So 
you have any any initiative, any recommendation, any proposal, I want to do this. Almost immediately, if you get 50 people see that proposal, they will, like oil being put on water, they will go bang into a faction. They won't call it a faction. Uh, they will call it an opinion. But people coalesce around similar opinions. It's kind of what a faction is. It's like we're like-minded people. So you get a particular proposal or a suggestion or you have a particular view of an individual or a department, people coalesce around similar opinions. And I know this when I'm doing change work with organizations. You know, we're putting some new values in. People go, great, fantastic, we needed that, versus what a load of rubbish. <laughs> this is corporate speak, and it'll mean nothing. Okay, so you've got two factions immediately, then you've got the fence sitters. So I hope that explains. It's like, you put anything in, you get factions. So you need to understand who are your allies? Who's offside? Who are the mavericks? Who are the skeptics? Who are the key decision makers and players? Let's say, you know, it's one of the things that we need to learn as salespeople is who's the buying committee? You know, the, the two axes of who's got influence, high or low, who's got authority, high and low. Well, clearly, you want to speak to people with influence and authority, but you need to speak to people with influence but no authority to sign it off. And you need to also cover off people who have authority to sign off but probably aren't actually going to be hands-on and have a huge amount of influence about how it plays out. And then we often spend time with people who have no influence and no authority but tell us they do. Well, yeah, that's a that's a common pitfall too. And and what you're what you're saying there, I think, is very detailed, but it's a really good starting point for the audience, is that Within your own organization, just the actual political dynamics, you know, decision makers, authority, hierarchies, factions, processes, KPIs, just navigating through that, the complexity of that sometimes can be can be overwhelming. But if we think about it, fundamentally, we're an organization that are looking to engage another organization. And so much of, of I think, the, the main through line of your answer there, Richard, was around just be perceptive to the political dynamic in your interactions. Understand who has the authority, who has the influence, who's projecting to have the influence when they don't. What are the requirements at a stakeholder level to get an initiative up through an organization with multiple layers and hierarchies? I think that it's a, a starting point. And one of the things, um, I'm hoping to have him as a guest on the podcast soon, but Julian Cole, who does a, a newsletter called Planning Dirty, he's a strategist. He actually encourages people, go into meetings, don't take notes on what you're discussing, take notes on the political dynamic in the room. So so sit there and observe how certain parties are interacting with each other. Get an understanding of how different departments and where process conflicts are arising and where issues are arising and be perceptive to that because as you build up that IP, then you have the ability to actually influence within that environment, which I found which I found really interesting. I agree with his his premise. I personally would find that pretty difficult to take dual notes on what's being discussed and also my observations around the politics all in the uh, the real time in of the, the meeting. In the space of one thing, yeah. Uh, yeah. And which, but how you do that is you actually take two of you in the room and you go, Jamie, you're doing the observation on the politics, I'm doing the observation or, and the, the, the note-taking on the substance of uh, what we're talking about. That's a great suggestion, Richard. And look, let's jump into something a bit more microscopic as the next question, because one of the common themes that comes up, and I really love actually the fact that this has come up from so many people because it means we can discuss it. In media sales, there seems to be in a lot of organizations, this concept of a two-speed organization, meaning that if you're fortunate to work in a high performance, highly driven, dynamic, fast paced sales team, one that's really aligned around a common goal, one that has really good operating practice but a team that needs to operate within a broader media business that's supported by, you know, different commercial functions. How would you suggest that somebody operates in that environment where maybe the pace of your organization doesn't match the intensity of your sales arm? I, I really believe in, in your own organization that your ability to get things done is based on the quality of your relationships. And if we look at our own behavior and referring back to something I said, we hang out with people who are like-minded and there can be a othering, to use a 
sort of in vogue word of anybody who's not like you. Um, and so you kind of go, oh, you know. But if you want something from someone, urgency, for instance, then you've got to have dug the well before you need to drink from it. So you need to build relationships right from the get-go before you actually want anything. So you need to kind of go, should we go out for lunch? You know, Hewlett Packard in the, um, in the 70s kind of phrase, management by wandering around. I'm a big believer, not going annoying people randomly, but actually going into other departments, uh, understanding who's there and building the relationship, okay? The, the thing is around your point about a two-speed organization, it's like, and we are, we're stereotyping sales team, high performance, operating with urgency. All right, let's go with that. Uh, okay. Uh, and they get frustrated by the other area of the business that they go is operating a little bit slower, a bit cruisier, whatever. And it's like you get really frustrated and you kind of go, well, yeah, I, I need this now. It's like, that sounds just like a whiny child. I want, I want, I want. And it's like, the really interesting thing is, salespeople do not apply the techniques that they hopefully have learnt and have trained and are practicing every day with their clients and prospects. They don't apply them internally to the people that probably are the harder sell because they don't think they need to because, well, we work for the same company and we're all aiming for the same vision. Well, how's that working for you? I mean, really. Uh, And so we, we end up getting really frustrated which is never a good look. We get uh, pleady. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think salespeople, when they're trying to sell internally, uh, go, often go to three very bad places. They're either desperate because <laughs> they've promised something to a prospect or a client and the clients kind of lock that in, right, you're going to do it. They haven't asked permission yet. They haven't asked whether it's possible yet. So they go to whoever it is, marketing, content, whatever, and go, and they're desperate because they realize they've dug themselves a commitment they can't follow through on. Or they're needy because maybe they are down on their sales targets and all that sort of stuff, and there's a little bit of pressure on, so they get needy. That's not a good look. Desperate people know they're desperate and they can't help it. Needy people actually don't think they're needy but if you ask the person they're talking to they go they're very needy and their language and behavior represents that or they go the other way they're arrogant and there's an sense of entitlement well that also doesn't work well for people in other departments the way you create urgency internally is and this is sales 101 You understand what's important to that person, that department, (laughs) what's on their plate at the moment, what's their challenges, what do they need to achieve, how can what you are asking them to do help them? I mean, isn't that what we're trying to do for our clients? I mean, if you are selling advertising space, you've missed the point. (laughs) You're not selling, selling, you're not selling a billboard, you're not selling a spot. You're not selling a banner page. You're not selling a page. You're selling the opportunity to get that brand across to an audience that hasn't heard it, to increase sales, to launch a product. That's what you're doing. One of the things that that you've raised here, which actually even I, I found quite interesting, is this idea of we apply all of these diplomatic soft skills and relationship building techniques to our external customers. And yet when it comes internally into our organization, we don't view our stakeholders or our support functions or the other people within our organization as our biggest customers either. Um, that's a really, really interesting point that you that you raise. And I think that's a that's part of being a good media salesperson. It's it's having that internal influence and that uh, that political capital, if you will, that you've invested time and energy to actually build. Uh, absolutely. And this is where some knowledge of human psychology comes in and the human condition and how we communicate you know you start with getting your own house in order uh, and uh, i i got a brief from 
I'm just working with a, a media agency this week, actually, and um, the brief from you know the person giving me the brief was, and he was going through all the names of the people, and he went, and those five, really good technically, they're new managers. He said, but they're still behaving like execs. No gravitas. You know, mm. if you are perceived in your media uh, organization as a yeah, pretty good salesperson, but not really a grown up, you don't get stuff done. You know, you, you actually won't get the headspace time from anybody in another department uh, to talk to you and understand and do you favors. Um, you just won't. You know, they, they might like you as a person, but they go, no. <laughs> you know, uh, because, and this is again the nature of organizational politics, which we don't understand, everybody's got competing priorities. It's like, what, you you think you're the only person asking me to do something today? Probably you, Jamie, like me, like everybody else out there, will get, over the course of a year, maybe 60 to 100 asks, could you donate money to this cause, charity, or event? It's like, well, unless you have a bottomless pit of money, you've got to say no to certain things. <laughs> On what basis? Well, you, you know, the lens that you see the work. Um, so that's the same in organizations. There's a hundred things for most people to do. So which do I do? The ones that I think further my cause better. Well, and this is, this is probably a good point to jump into this next question, because I think that issue of, for want of a better term, initiative overload that everybody has, that's compounded by the fact that the common theme in media right now is change. Now, probably everywhere. However, I think it's probably accelerated in these media organizations. It's an inevitability that there are still many cultural and political issues that are going to arise from when an organization is transforming. And that's why your business probably in a large part actually exists, uh, Richard, is yep. helping organizations manage change. And so for the audience, you know, what are some of the issues to expect and what's a clear path to manage through some of those issues with minimal disruption when change is a constant of your organization and your market? You're absolutely right. Um, you know, I used to call my business a training company, you know, back in the 90s. Uh, I really, you know, it did what it says on tin, you're around training organisations. But I, I, you know, I've come to the conclusion many years ago, I, I wasn't really in the business of, of, of training per se, and certainly that wasn't the end. It's really around helping people, and teams and ladder up to organizations change. Because if we don't, you know, we're dead in the water. Change is really hard. Um, if you look at something of how to live a healthy life. Okay, so most people know how to live a healthy life. Uh, uh, exercise regularly, eat well, drink enough water, you know, get enough sleep. Sleep. So everybody knows this. Everybody. Knowing and actually living that out, very difficult. You know, this idea of how do you build better habits um, and evolve gradually is, is interesting. You, you map change into an organization. I, th I think people have, you know, oh, you know the, the mantra, change is good. Change is not good for a lot of people. Change is never win-win. <laughs> never. Not in an organizational context. Uh, people lose out. Some people lose their jobs. Restructure, well, that's change. Merger and acquisition, that's change. Not everybody keeps their job. But if we go beyond that, people lose power. They lose status. They lose influence. They lose resources. Okay. Um, uh, perceived or real. So depending on your perception of change will depend on which faction you sit in. We talk about, you know, politics, it's like, so we need to be really smart if change is happening in our organization. You know, whose star is on the rise? Who's not? You know, you look at those TV programs that we were talking about. It's, it's like, you know, script writers are writing a wonderful journey of, you know, you know, manipulation and, and politics with people, you know, in one minute, not the next. 
And this is impacting people from the get-go. If you're in your first year in media sales, or you're in your fifth year, or you're in your tenth year, whether you are an exec or a manager or a director or a general manager, this is playing out differently, sure, because of your seniority, but it is playing out nonetheless. And I, I don't think people pay enough attention to and think through what's happening, why it's happening, how it's impacting people. The audience listening to this podcast usually aren't you know, pulling the levers of power. They're usually on the receiving end. But it's, it's really important to reflect and think about why is someone doing this? I'll give you an example in, in true politics. It's like, because people, what they say versus what they do doesn't often align. So you might well have a politician who genuinely and deeply believes that the world is going to hell in a handbasket if we don't sort out climate change. We've got to change it. Okay. But in their electorate, is an aluminium smelter and a cement manufacturer. Both of you are big employers, but chew off... It's like, well, it's no wonder <laughs> that, you know, they don't, you know, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. Uh, they're not going to actually sit down on the side of that. This is true in organisations. It's true in your clients' organisations. It's true in your own. You need to look at what are the underlying loyalties that someone has both to people causes departments um, that may be driving their behavior as against what they say a really good way of thinking of it and i think one of the themes that we we i suppose when we're talking about all of these questions we're talking about longer term behavioral kind of kind of change for salespeople. So, you know, how do I how do I spend the next 12 months getting a lot better at my internal and my external politics and, and my understanding? And as we draw this to a close, Richard, I, I think one of the things that would be remiss of us not to talk about is those moments where we're at that pointy end of internal politics. So, you know, dealing with conflict in the moment when it's happening. I think if we give the context of media sales, you know, we're talking about being in a high volume deadline-driven environment, we've got revenue-related pressure, we've got clear accountability over whether or not we're performing in terms of our, our performance to budget. And what happens when we have an internal stakeholder um, who might be blocking or dropping the ball on a critical piece of business is, is that we typically see a bit of a blow-up. We see people you know, have those heightened levels of emotion really, really start to take over their thinking. And, and I want to know from your perspective – when time pressures are present and they're exacerbating an issue where you're having a political a political issue, how can people work through that logically in a way that protects their reputation and gets an outcome that they need? Right. In a situation like you've described, you've got to play assertively. All other options don't work. Aggressive, blow up, doesn't work. <laughs> uh, passive aggressive, that's just seen as sneaky. And that'll come back to bite you. Passive doesn't get anything done. Um, you've got to show high emotional intelligence, self-awareness, social awareness and empathy for what the other person is, is doing, uh, a level of emotional control um, and, you know, an ability to see both sides of the coin. You've got to be the grown-up in the room. You cannot play, you know, whiny child or... Uh, nagging, you know, critical parent. That, you know, there's a technical term there. You've got to be really fo solution focused. Uh, and you've got to own you're part of the problem in the sense that you will probably have been complicit in some way in terms of causing this to happen. So all of those things you go, I hear what Richard said. They're really hard to do. You know, it, it, it requires you know, work on all of those things. Um, now, I, I was listening to another podcast uh, earlier this week. Uh, it's, a, it's a guy called Derek Sivers talking to Tim Ferriss. And he went, people overestimate what they can do in a day, but they underestimate what they can do in a year. So 
basically your daily to-do list is a laundry list of stuff that is way over optimistic you're never going to get it done get frustrated all that type of stuff but this underestimate what you can do in a year as i put if, if you actually work on your assertive skills your emotional intelligence you know your understanding of human psychology let's say you did 10 minutes a day for 365 days a year you would be really good at that <laughs> you know if you did 10 minutes or 15 minutes learning a language for a whole year you would be conversationally proficient probably beyond your wildest dreams learn a software you know whatever it is people don't do that they, they go oh, I'm so busy <laughs> you know you, the answer is how do you manage conflict you know in a pressure cooker situation well You've got to work at that, just like you have to work at getting fit. There isn't an easy answer. You know, you could help me as your personal trainer, you know, if we're talking about getting fit. I'll help you a lot, but I am going to do zero amount of the exercise that's going to give you a six-pack. You're going to do all of that. The one thing I would suggest, too, is that we don't spend enough time debriefing these things when they happen. We're so task oriented oftentimes. It's like, look, we've got an issue that the client's flagged. We need to get a resolution. We need to get it yesterday. And to hell with any collateral damage that I'm going to leave in my wake, I'm going to get the solution for the client. Having to potentially go back and pick up the pieces of that or to maybe repair some damaged relationships that come from that, from being very forceful in the moment, very time consuming. And what I would encourage people listening to do is to actually just look at when those kind of issues arise, you know, those, those as we call them, the roadblocks or the, the, the blow-ups <laughs> that, can, that can actually occur. Have a bit of time after one of those has, has occurred to maybe unpack it and debrief it and have a think about it in terms of what could I have done differently in that moment? Where did my emotion get the better of me? You know, did I maintain composure in the right moments? Would my peers see me? as somebody who handled that with maturity and professionalism. Those kind of things I think we just move on from and we don't spend enough time actually going no. back and reflecting on. No, we, we, we don't. I would absolutely urge people uh, to get into the habit of doing some type of daily reflection where you go, what happened? What did I learn? What happened? Why did it happen? What did I learn? What do I do differently tomorrow? Repeat. Okay? The, the, the thing that... Uh, I think we need to do, and we're veering off just political thinking to you know, really getting yourself in the best place, but do not compare yourself to other people today. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday and be a bit better today. And you cannot do that if you're just being busy. <laughs> uh, and I, I talk, you know, let's take it back to politics, is we do not do anywhere near enough reflect. Why did we win that? Why did we lose that? Who did we miss out? I, even today, if I look at when I lost a client, I lost a big client earlier in the year, you know, after four years. You know, it's easy to kid myself that I did everything right. When I did a full, you know, post-mortem, I got a list of 10 things that I should have done in 2018 that I didn't do. None of them huge that was actually politically not smart. You know, I know you're talking to me as a supposed expert, but it's like you don't get the, it's not it's a journey. It's not a destination. And uh, I, I think it is really important that we understand that, because unless you take a good look at what happened, you're never going to get politically smart. That is a really nice, really nice thought to end on. And I completely agree. I think the the idea of progress before perfection and comparing yourself to yourself is so vital in this role. It's so important that we that we can continually make sure that as long as we're getting incrementally better every day in this role, you know that is actually a good thing. Uh, let's jump into the next topic now, Richard, because I've got a bit of a doozy for you. I can't ask my sales manager that. This is one of my favourite segments because it it it, it unearths some really interesting uh, questions that I think people have really been maybe struggling with and sitting on. So, look, this person comes from New South Wales. Um, he has asked me to withhold his name and his, uh, his company he works for, uh, but I can say that he is a digital media rep. So... I'm going to jump into the question and then let's uh, let's unpack it a bit and see if we can help problem solve it on the fly, Richard. Okay. The question is, 
What do you do when you need support from people in your business who refuse to be held accountable? I have tons of people in my business who I rely upon to help me service my clients. The issue is that they are constantly missing deadlines, their standard of work is average at best. Whenever an issue comes up, it's always thrown back at me as something I didn't do or a process I didn't follow. My boss doesn't manage a lot of these people and hasn't been any help. When I tell them that I now need to call the client and deal with the aftermath, one senior person had the gall to tell me that that's why I get commission. How do I hold people accountable for doing their job when the business won't? So let's just reflect on that because I very rarely do I read a question that has this much punctuation and exclamation marks in it. So I can sense the frustration here. Um, the first thing I'd say reacting to that is, is that doesn't seem like anything out of the ordinary to me um, at all. So, so let's just take the heat out of this and go, the frustration you're feeling here is, is kind of a norm of the industry in, in my view. Um, what would you say just reflecting on that question, Richard? What do you think's going on here? There's a bit of blame going on both sides. Okay, so the uh, the media reps going, it's all their fault. <laughs> They're not holding themselves accountable. The people in uh, that uh, he or she is talking about are also going, well, it, it's your responsibility and it's your fault. Um, so you've got a, a conflict situation. What are your options? Okay, um, we come back to the uh, uh, four behavior choices you behave assertively, aggressively, passive-aggressively, or passively. You could escalate it to your boss and go, well, you get paid more than me and you're more experienced. Could you deal with it? I think that's abdicating. You could try and do something, you know, underhand. But I, look, we cut to the chase, Jamie. I, you and I have worked together many times, so you know I'm big on have the conversation that you need to have with the person when the heat is off, if you can. In other words, you deal with the mess as best you can. Once it's done and there's not this he said, she said going on. And, and let's say I'm the media sales rep and you're the person in the other department. Jamie, just role play with me here. Uh, I'd come back to you and go, Jamie, can we go out for a coffee? Because we had a real, you know, set to last week with that which thank it, it's it's sorted but that's happened a few times and you know i'm sure it's frustrating you it's frustrating me i reckon you know it's worth half an hour of our time to sort of kick around how we handle this in you know in the future because it, it's going to come up again because it's the nature of our business so i'd, I'd set it up not as a i'm going to give you a real talking to I'm going to set it up as a we. This is a problem for both of us. I'm sure it's frustrating you. So I've got a decent intention. It's not to give you a kicking. Then, when we're having the conversation, we are really clear about what has happened and the behavior that has caused it to happen on both sides. We do not get into judgy, name-calling, you know, you're arrogant, difficult, you know, whatever. Just talk about the behavior. You also show some understanding of, look, I get it from your point of view as to why you are going, you know, we get paid the commission and this, that and the other, or why you haven't been able to do this. But then you need to say, this is how I feel. This is where I'm at. Not a, an, an, a, It's got to be an I statement, look, but I feel really frustrated, I, to be honest. I feel, you know, whatever it is, whatever is your emotion, kind of go, put it on the table. It's actually very powerful because people can't contradict it and go, no, you're not feeling that. Okay, what I need us to do is to figure out how we deal with this type of situation because it comes up twice a month or three times a month or whatever, and it ain't good. Now, the final kicker is there's got to be a consequence now, I'm the father of two children, one 16-year-old girl, one 13-year-old son. And I know, as a parent of a child, and we could all relate to this when we were children, our parents give us certain consequences. If you don't do that, then this. <laughs> First of all, you've got to go, that consequence is either something I want, because a consequence can be positive, or something I don't want. 
and the person has got to be able to follow through. So if you think your mum and dad is all talk, but they never follow through, hmm, okay. Now you play this into uh, office politics and interaction. People are, okay, well, I had a conversation with Jamie and nothing changed. I go, so what was, what was the consequence you gave them? What, what do you mean? Well, a consequence has either got to be something Jamie wants to happen. If you do this, if we can do this, then this, and it's a good thing. Or if you don't do this, then this happens. And that's a bad thing. And they go, oh, I didn't do that. Well, you need to do that because you're not getting the behavior change. You're missing the most important element <laughs> that shifts people's behavior. Oh, the next answer is, yeah, but they're more senior to me and I have no authority over them. So I go, so, so you're saying if they carry on treating you like this, they can operate with impunity. There is no downside. You confront people with that reality. They, they're often stuck in a place, no, I have no power. I, I, I never believe that is true. So part of my coaching is often to help them find where they've got a power, where they've got an influence. How can you, if they play ball with you, give them something they want? Or not. People often don't think they've got, you know, with a sale, with a sales manager, I can't, this section, I can't ask my sales manager that. Well, there are plenty of really poor sales managers and sales, you know, media sales people think, oh, I've not got the power. Well, you do, because ultimately sales managers are judged on the performance of their teams. Performance of their teams is hitting sales targets, not having loads of churn, discretionary effort from people in the sales team. You know, we all have the opportunity to take our bat and ball home. There's power everywhere if we but see it. So I can't get into the specifics of what needs to be said here. But I, if I was coaching this person, I would say you need to prepare for the conversation well. You need to think what your intentions are and tell them that. You need to look at the specific instance. You need to understand the rationale in an empathetic way you need to share what you're feeling you need to here's here's the impact say what you need to happen which may be a deeper conversation or a new system and you need to have a consequence uh, and the conversation continues you know it's not a say your piece for five minutes thank you jamie bye bye that conversation may be an hour long and it may be hard got to have it I don't think I've got a single additional thought to add to that. I think that is a brilliant solution for this person. And, you know, the one thing that I, I really like about the way you attack that was to, to first and foremost really quickly diagnose what was going on, which is a process conflict and a blame issue here before everything else. Um, so I, I applaud you for calling that out. Um, for this particular individual, if you want to speak further to Richard, um, you know, feel free to just come come through to me again, and I'm happy to, to connect you too. Um, I can certainly vouch for your coaching ability, Richard. He, he doesn't pull any punches, but ultimately it's with a view to helping you get over these um, or, or you know, to be able to tackle these types of organizational hurdles and challenges. Richard, I want to thank you for your time today. I feel like we we potentially could jump into another podcast or another topic within almost like its own subset of, of organizational politics. But for the sake of today's episode, was there any sort of parting comment or thought to wrap this topic up for the audience? One tip, uh, and this is outward understanding politics. Get yourself someone on who is on your side in the client or prospects organization. Uh, call them a champion, call them a coach, but uh, and you can have different ones as you ladder up and deepen your relationship. But a coach or a champion who's on your side in the organization could be the receptionist. <laughs> I don't care. Is someone who will give you more information around how that system works. Remember, I said politics is understanding the system and the organization. So someone will tell you who's who in the zoo, what's happening in the business. By the way, they're not sharing state secrets here. Someone who's going to go, I'll tell you what, Jamie, your proposal was presented uh, yesterday. Um, you'd got about three people on your side. You'd got about two people off. And these were the objections. <laughs> who will give you a little bit of information, who maybe will give you access to. So you say to someone, how do I, you know, I know they're part of the buying committee 
What makes them tick? What's their personality like? What, you know, what's on their plate at the moment? What's happening in the business? I can't overemphasize the value of having something like that. It gives you a different understanding of the organization you're selling into. And by the way, have a coach internally as well in your own organization because they'll also give the inside track about what's happening in different departments. Great wrap up, Richard. Really, really, really good points there. Uh, look, I really enjoyed this chat today, mate. As a final thought from me before we wrap this up, you know, media sales, if nothing else, is actually about politics. It's about mental toughness. It's about persistence. It's about EQ. So for the people out there, what I say to you sincerely from someone who's been there is if you're struggling, remember it's about progress before perfection. You know, that's a that's a real, I know, uh, area that you're quite passionate about too, Richard. If you are getting incrementally better each day, if you are comparing yourself to the person you were yesterday and you are making progress, you are on track to master media sales as a profession. I'm Jamie Wood. Keep driving forward. Have an amazing week. Richard Wentworth Ping, thank you for your time today, sir. Pleasure. You've been listening to Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. Head to mediasalesmastery.com to help pick the topic, guide the show, and don't forget to subscribe to receive new episodes each week.